All right, good evening, everyone. I'm gonna give it a couple of minutes to allow people to um, come in and then we will get started. So thank you everyone for being here. Lindsay, will I see any pictures of people or not? It'll just be us. It'll just be us. Yep. Got it. Awesome. Well, not awesome, but <laughs> at least okay. you know what to expect. Right. Exactly. Exactly. I'm going to give it about two more minutes. All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. It looks like we have a, a small turnout, but we are recording this webinar. We're going to post it to our website. Um, welcome, everyone, to Intentional Relationships. My name is Lindsay Gotanda, and I'm the Deputy Superintendent for the district. Um, just to give you a little bit of housekeeping items for this webinar, um, our chat actually is going to come to um, both myself and uh, Ms. Elledge here, who is going to be our speaker. Um, however, if you have any questions that you would like to ask, please feel free, free to put those in the Q&A. Um, at the end, we will be doing um, some question and answer, so please feel free to put things in there. And then if there's something that is in the chat, I mean the Q&A that's related to the district, um, I will respond um, by typing um, because I want to make sure that if you have any questions that all of those things are actually answered. Um, it is so exciting to have Jennifer Ellich here tonight. Um, she is actually a very popular in-demand adolescent health speaker that's taught thousands of parents and young people for over 20 years the importance of being healthy in the many facets of life. She is a mother and founder of the Talk Institute, which provides parent-child health education to hundreds of local South Bay families. Um, today, she is here to help parents support their children in developing healthy and intentional relationships. Um, it is absolutely my pleasure to um, welcome Jennifer Elledge tonight. Thank you so much, Lindsay. And all of you guys, thank you so much for being here. Your time is so valuable. And I'm not sure exactly what brought you here today, what you're hoping to glean from today's um, conversation, but I hope that you get some actionable tips um, along with some of the theory behind how to have more intentional relationships in our lives and helping our ch children develop those. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so we can go ahead 
and get started. So like Lindsay said, my name is Jennifer um, and I'm the founder of the Talk Institute and I'm also an adolescent health expert. Um, I do lots of different talks and one of the talks that um, I'm asked to do often is on relationships. So relationships are so, there's so many different types, right? And we all need reminders to tend to our relationships. Um, they need fostering. Sometimes we need to reconnect with our friends or family members we've lost touch with. And sometimes relationships also need repair at times. No matter what relationship you're looking at or you're in, we all relationships have ups and downs. There's conflict sometimes, there's joy, there's sorrow. Um, sometimes relationships last a short time, sometimes they last a lifetime. Some are healthy and unhealthy at times. Some can also be fulfilling or disappointing. So we are you know, part of parents' job, I guess, is to help our children navigate relationships. And to do that, I think one of the easiest ways to do that is to be intentional in your own relationships, right? And to work on the relationships in your life so your child sees you modeling that. Now, what's interesting about this though is what is easy to do is also easy not to do. So what we're gonna be talking about today is really not any rocket science thing, right? I mean, this is stuff you guys know, you've heard of before, but like I said, it's, it's the reminders that we need. We need to um, remember to, to invest in our relationships and invest um, in our kids and teach them what they need to know to have healthy ones. Okay. One of the things I like to say is that relationships are kind of, should be at least 80, 20. Now, what I mean by that is 80% of the time, a relationship should be good, right? Or in, in a specific relationship, we should feel good in that relationship most of the time. 20% of the time there's hiccups. There's things that you're going to need to work through or work on. Maybe you have a fight, conflict, disagreement, something like that, okay? So I created this uh, little acronym for today just to help us guide our conversation and to help you remember it so you can also share it with your children, okay? So we're gonna talk about creating perfect relationships. Now, I know this is misspelled, okay? I know how to spell perfect, I know it has an E, but I could not let go of the A. I really needed the A and you'll see why um, when we get there. And, and, and I guess you can say if, if relationships are 80-20 anyways, they're not perfect anyway, right? So we're gonna get as close to the best, most fulfilling relationships that we can create, all right? Okay, so in our perfect relationship, the P stands for play, right? Play. And this is probably a little bit of a surprise to you, but Playing together is one of the most effective tools for building strong relationships. Play adds joy, it adds vitality and resilience relationships. It helps re um, heal resentments and disagreements, hurt. And children love play. And through play, that's how they learn to trust others and feel safe. By making a conscious effort to incorporate humor and play in our daily interactions with our children, you can improve the quality of your relationships and connect on a deeper level. Play and laughter perform an essential role in building strong, healthy relationships. And they bring you closer, they create a positive bond and resolve conflict. I like to say that families that play together, stay together, right? Now, how do you incorporate more play into your day? I have some little tips for you. The first thing is just joke around, be silly in everyday moments. You know, one of the things that um, we do as a family is we sing in the car a lot, right? And we'll sing funny songs and we'll make up songs and do things like that. So that's an example, how to be a little more silly and play in your everyday life. Okay. Um, of course, games are great. So if you can play a game with your kids, uh, do a puzzle, play a sport together, do a hobby together. And this also helps them in their friendships. So when they play with their friends and do these things, this is also what is going to help their relationships with their friends. All right. Another thing to think about is when kids are playing, try not to like over schedule their play, like allow time for spontaneity and, and, you know, make up a game and be creative in their play. That is so good for them. That helps them also 
um, figure out social skills a bit too. So they learn how to negotiate and compromise and take turns and things like that when there isn't so much organization in their play, all right? And I think it's important if you wanna be intentional in your relationships, you gotta, re you gotta schedule time for relationships. So for me, one of the things that I like to do is I like to just make sure that at least I talk to one friend a day at least one friend a day. So whether that is a, a text message, email, or an actual phone call, I try to make sure I reach out to a friend each day. And it's helpful if you have a habit already to do habit stacking. So for example, maybe you walk every morning, you walk your dog every morning, okay? Well, you can put another habit on top of that habit. And so you maybe on that walk, you call a friend, right? Another thing is have regular like family time. So sometimes families get really creative with this, um, but something simple you can do is just have like a like themed meal nights, um, your family traditions, things you do around, around holidays and things like that are all an important part of family time and try to play and have a good time when you do that. Okay. Um, by the way, with play, that's also something that works really great with team building in the workplace, right? When, when coworkers play together, they develop a stronger relationship. And it's also great for teachers, right? I mean, I use, I use games and play in all of the programs that I teach all the time. So it's, it's just such an important thing. All right. In a perfect relationship, another thing that's super important is to teach our children empathy. Okay, how do you do that? And what exactly is empathy? Well, empathy in a nutshell, I guess, it, it means that we can imagine what someone else is thinking or feeling and then respond in a caring manner. A lot of people say, um, imagine yourself in someone else's shoes, okay? Um, it's a skill, but it's also something that we can cultivate and strengthen with practice. And it takes practice to have good empathy. Helping children develop empathy helps build their emotional intelligence. And you guys, this is something that is said to be a higher predictor of success in life than someone's IQ. When someone can read another person and maybe understand what maybe they're not saying by their body language and learning how to connect to others on an emotional level, they're gonna have better relationships and be happier and be more successful in life. How in the world do you teach empathy? Like this is like, how do you teach this, right? You can, you can totally teach it. You can encourage perspective taking and putting yourself in someone else's shoes. You can ask them what someone else might be feeling or thinking to teach them to consider that more in their relationships. And I think one of the easiest ways to do this is by like reading books together, with literature or watching shows together. And you can pause or when it's over, you're done, you can ask questions to your child and say, hey, how do you think this person feels right now? Or what do you think he needs, right? So trying to help them anticipate needs, think about others more is going to help foster empathy. Another really easy thing you can try too is when you're gift giving, so like, let's say your child's friend has a birthday party coming up and you're gonna go buy a gift for them. You can, this is a teachable moment to teach empathy because you can ask them a little bit about their friend and say, you know, hey, tell me something about, you know, some of the things your friend likes. Oh, well, they like, they like to play um, video games. Oh, neat. Well, maybe we can buy a video game for their, for their gift this year, right? Oh, that would be great. So you're just sort of guiding them through thinking about how to get a thoughtful gift for someone, how to be thoughtful towards someone, right? Good stuff. And of course, if you model this with your friends and, you, and your child, like you're empathetic towards your child, they're going to pick it up from you. That's the easiest way to show children how to do anything is model it. All right. Our next letter is R. And R stands for respect. And respect is a very important part of relationships. Um, respect is a feeling of, of admiration for someone's abilities. Maybe there's something about their character that you think is great um, or an appreciation of who they are as just a person. To feel respected is to feel accepted as you are, to feel valued, to feel safe and to be treated fairly and 
Okay, so to feel that, you're going to have to talk to your children about respect, what to do when they're not being respected, and how to set boundaries with people. This is going to be a very important part of relationship building. Okay, now, of course, we can't force someone to respect us, but we shouldn't have to deal with disrespect. And I think it's important that we talk to our children and empower them to speak up for themselves and um, and others, right? When they see someone being disrespected. So, you know, any bullying behavior and stuff like that to be an upstander, to speak up. Relationships are supposed to be reciprocal and balanced. Like it, they're not balanced all the time. Like maybe there, there might be times in a relationship where someone needs the other person more and it's not balanced at that moment. But once they get through that, it should balance back out again, right? And relationships, when they're, they're not balanced or reciprocal, sometimes, you know, they can be very difficult and not healthy. So sometimes we need to set boundaries with others. And this is the thing. A lot of times, especially children, they may not know what their boundaries are until they're stepped on. Right, a lot of that, and that's the case for a lot of us. Maybe we didn't realize we had a boundary until someone crossed it. It's important to model and have discussions about the importance of setting boundaries. Okay, so what does that look like? There's a couple things here that I'd recommend. <clears throat> One of the things is to talk about language, and when I when I teach peer pressure in my program. Um, one of the things I talk about is avoiding wishy-washy or uncertain words when they don't want to do something or they're trying to set a boundary, okay? So a wishy-washy word might be something like, I don't think this is a good idea, guys, or so I don't think, or um, probably, I'm not sure, uh, I guess, things like that that aren't very strong words. There, sometimes we think we're being kind when we use words like that, but all it does is makes you sound unsure of yourself. And when someone else is sure, they're now going to try to convince you otherwise, right? So they're going to they're gonna experience more pressure if they use wishy-washy language often. So one of the things you can do too is, is give them, like talk about different tactics of handling pressure or when you need to set a boundary. So one of the things I like to say is teach a one-liner like, I'm okay with this, but not that, okay? I'm fine um, sleeping over at your house tonight, but I'm not okay with not lying to my mom about there not being a parent there, right? That's not the best example, but just you know, give you an idea of something a way that they could say, I'm okay with this, but not that. Another thing I think is an important skill for children to have is how to gracefully decline an invitation. So if they're invited to do something and they don't want to or can't, what can they say to decline that in a way that doesn't make them feel like they're being mean to that person slash they get invited next time? So one of the things I, I like to talk about too is, is something called sandwiching your no or sandwiching your, um, your beef, your problem, um, your conflict. Okay, and we'll talk about conflict in a bit, but as far as the invitation goes, the way this could sound is you could say, oh, thank you so much for inviting me to the beach this week. And that sounds super fun. I can't go, I have family in town, I'm sorry. Will you please let me know when you go again? So you're you're sandwiching the no a bit. You're, 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 you're saying thank you for the invite. I can't make it. Please let me know next time. Invite me next time, right? Let, let me know you're gonna do it again. That way it can feel a little more graceful to say no to something. All right. The F stands for feedback. I don't know if this looks familiar in your household or not, if how old your children are. Um, as they get older, sometimes it, you see a little more of this. But feedback is a really important part of relationships as well. And it, it's, it, it's an important to give and receive feedback. There's a lot of different types of feedback though. So let me unpack this a little bit. There can be positive feedback or praise. 
um, maybe you say something like, you handle that situation really well, sweetie, to your child. Okay, that would be some positive feedback. There's also constructive feedback that might sound like when you whispered to your friend, I noticed your other friend felt left out. So it might be a suggestion or something to think about for next time. There's also negative feedback. And this is usually critical and judgmental and not usually well received. And there's also unsolicited feedback that's not asked for or wanted. And this is something we should consider and think about um, with our teens too, just make sure that we ask permission for, to give feedback at times, okay? So these are some tips. Ask before giving constructive feedback. Sometimes let's say you have, um, uh, your teen is, venting to you about their problem at school or something that happened at school or with a friend. We are really quick sometimes as parents to want to jump in and fix their problem, right? It's really easy to want to do that. We don't want our kids to suffer. We want to fix it. But that's not always the best thing for kids in the long run for you fixing it. They need to learn how to fix things themselves, obviously, as they, especially as they're getting older, they're gonna need to do more on that on their own. Now, if they're venting to you and you feel like you wanna give them advice, what I recommend is asking first. So how you, what you could say is just say, okay, I, I, it sounds like you had a really rough time with your friend today. Thank you for sharing that with me. I hope you feel better talking about it. Um, would you, did you just want to vent or would you like some feedback? Okay, that's simple. Are you trying, did you just need to vent or would you like some feedback? And if they say like some feedback, then free game. And if they just wanted to vent, hold back, okay? Now, when you do give feedback, that sandwich technique works really well here too. So what you wanna start with is what is good, then what is not, and then what you'd like to do about it. So you sandwich your problem, your beef, the issue in the middle, okay? So when you're, when you're providing a solution, you know, at the end there, there should be some, some way to make it better at the end, okay? So how this might sound with that last example with the, um, the kids whispering to their friend, um, maybe you start with, you know, sweetheart, you are such a good friend and your friends are really lucky to have you. When you had your play date the other day, I noticed something and there was a point where you whispered to your friend and you left your other friend, it looked like you left your other friend out like you, cause you were telling a secret. Uh, I'm not sure if you realized that you did that or not, but I think maybe next time we, it'd be best to not whisper. So someone doesn't think they're being talked about or being left out or feels left out. Okay, so you start with what's good. You're a great friend. Your friends are lucky to have you. This is what I noticed. This is what you could do better. This is the feedback. And this is something I think that you could do to fix it or try or consider for next time. So that's how that would sound. And that's a great thing to teach your children, by the way, to sandwich their feedback. Because sometimes when they have problems or they're in a fight with a friend, they might not know how to address that conflict with so if you teach the sandwich method, that will teach them how to be heard more because it, it lowers defenses. When you start with what's good, people listen better and they're more open to what you have to say because you didn't just attack them. You didn't just jump in right away, all right? Another thing is we need to talk about feelings and we need to help our, our children identify and identify their feelings when they're having them, to name them and also develop some self-control to manage their feelings effectively. So they're having really strong feelings, talking about ways to calm down, taking deep breaths, counting to 10, things like that. Maybe waiting to have a discussion with someone until their feelings have subsided a bit, things like that. Um, and also teach them to own their feelings by using I language versus you language when sharing feelings with others. So, you made me feel left out when you whispered to our friend versus when you whispered to, to our friend, it 
I felt left out when that happened. It's just a little bit different, but I promise the way it's received is much better. So you is very attacking a lot of times and I is more of ownership of your own feelings. And we wanna teach our kids that. Another thing is when we're giving feedback, just to be more intentional and loving in our own interactions. So I do have some good little one-liners here for you. So here's some different ways you can be more loving in your own feedback with your children. And there's some really good ones here. I hope you can grab a couple that you like, write them down real quick, okay? Um, some of my favorite, I love, let's see here. That was a good choice. Thanks for doing that before I could even ask. You handled that situation very well. I believe you can do it. You have really improved on blank. That's a great question and I'm always here for you, okay? Things like that, just build confidence, make ch children feel safe and loved and it's just so good. So I hope that's helpful. By the way, Pinterest has some great ideas. If you're looking for other things to say, um, definitely check there. There's some great ideas. Okay. Another thing that we want to be cautious of in our feedback, especially as parents or teachers or people who are um, teaching young people, okay? We want to have more of a growth mindset versus fixed. So when we give praise, we want to give praise for effort, for trying, for, for working hard, for sticking with it, things like that, learning from their mistakes, not for more fixed abilities like, oh, you're talented or, oh, that was really, you're so smart, um, you know, not making mistakes or only for winning and things like that. So just, just be cautious and mindful of that. Um, we want to make sure our, our children know that they can grow into these different abilities, right? Like, it, you know, things take practice and it's not, not everyone is just naturally good at something. And it's just because someone's smart doesn't mean they're smart at everything, right? And so those kinds of things, are, is, that, that's why we want to be cautious of that. We don't want them to, to conflict at some point in their life where then they think they're no longer that, okay? Now the A stands for, this is the one I couldn't let go of you guys. So A stands for attention and I did a double one and appreciation, attention and appreciation. So why is attention important in relationships? Well, it's the basic food and water of living and breathing of a relationship. It's how we nurture and feed relationships and without it, it's not gonna survive. And attention, can be improved um, by improving your listening skills, right? And that's gonna strengthen your relationships. If you can work on being a good listener, oh my gosh, that's such a long lost skill. People don't listen the way we should. We're so distracted today. And if you're a good listener, people are gonna remember you. You're gonna, it's gonna show in a powerful way. And um, I just think it's an important part of, of being present for someone, right? And it's the most, it's basic expression of love and we all need, crave and deserve attention. So I have another fun little acronym for you. I hope I'm not going too crazy with the acronyms, but you wanna teach your children not to just listen, but to hear someone. And the hear, I came up with a little something for this. Um, the first thing we wanna do when we wanna hear somebody and really listen, you wanna halt. Halt and stop what you're doing quiet your thoughts, give the speaker your attention, don't seem too distracted, try not to interrupt. And if you are distracted, to schedule time when you can fully listen. So especially as parents, I know sometimes, you know, my son wants to talk to me or say something and it just, maybe I'm cooking dinner or I'm busy, I have to work, I'm in the middle of an email, whatever it is. Just let your children know hey, I really wanna to listen to you and, and hear what you have to say or what you wanna tell me. I, I need to finish what I'm doing right now. Can you give me 30 minutes and then you'll have my undivided attention? Or can we talk about this later tonight before bed? So you can always schedule it for later if you need to. Engage, 
give your full attention with your body language. That means like, you know, leaning in and smiling, nodding, all those things. Make sure you, you're listening, use your voice, um, respond to what someone's saying. And when we activate and involve our physical selves, we're more engaged and connected. So it, when you can physically do something to make yourself listen, it's easier to be more attentive. And then acknowledge. Acknowledge and listen for values, feelings, and fears. Once you picked up on those things um, that worry someone, you can be more sensitive being supported by reassuring them where they may be less confident. Okay, so if you, if you notice a feeling that they're talking about, hold on to that because you're gonna need that for the R. This is where we, ref we reflect. So you can say back to someone what you heard. It sounds to me like you had a really terrible day today. I'm so sorry about that. What can I do to make cheer you up? Um, something like that. Or you might paraphrase or summarize what they said. And if you hear a feeling in the acknowledgement, if you notice a feeling, make sure you, that, that you say that in the reflection. What's great is that if you're wrong, if that wasn't what they were feeling, the speaker's gonna correct you. No, I, I, it wasn't a terrible day. It was just a long, tiring day, right? So they'll, they'll just correct you. And at the end of the day, if you're, you're doing that though, they're gonna feel hurt. You're gonna seem interested. And they're going to think you're a good listener. And you are going to be because, I mean, it, it, it really isn't hard to listen. It's just, we're all just so distracted and it's just in our own heads about things. So it's just important to remember to hear someone when they need us, especially when they have something important to say. All right. Now, speaking of listening, sometimes when we um, you know, have relationships that have, you know, or have lasted a long time, we may find find that there's things that we uh, don't don't have as much to talk about, I guess. So if you're doing, you're picking your kids up from school, I know one of the first things you say is, how was your day today? And a lot of times you get a one word answer like, oh, good or fine or whatever. And you don't really get anything else. So if you want some other ideas, here's some other ideas of what you could ask as well. Um, what are some of my favorite on here? I love, when were you the happiest today? Um, what is the coolest, saddest, funniest, or scariest thing that you saw today? And I like the last one too. If you got to be the teacher tomorrow, what would you do differently? So again, if you need more ideas, Pinterest is awesome and can help. Okay. Now the second part of the A, the other word I didn't want to let go of is appreciation. As human beings, we all have a deep-seated need to feel appreciated for who we are and what we contribute to the world. It's important to tell people they matter to us and we notice them. And showing gratitude is an expression of love and appreciation. And when we teach gratitude to our kids, it makes them happier. You, when you're grateful, it's hard to be sad. Just the feeling doesn't match. So teaching gratitude is such a good thing for our kids. Oops, sorry, the wrong way. There we go. So how to appreciate more. All right, make it a daily habit. So one of the things that you can do as a family is like at mealtime, you guys can share like a high and a low of the day and everybody does that. Or maybe at bedtime, if you, you know, put your kid to bed at all. Um, you can also have like a gratitude jar or journal or box or something. Um, I used to have this like stack of like little post-it notes um, that I did a gratitude box with. And just each day, I think I just grab a couple pieces of paper, maybe three to five pieces of paper and rip it off. And I would just write something I'm grateful for. And that could be something that you do as a family, you know, write three things that you're grateful for each morning or before you go to bed. Look for small things to do for someone. And when someone does these things for you, thank them. Uh, it's the little things, you guys. Like my husband makes me coffee in the morning and it's just a little small thing. I appreciate it so much. I love it. And I got, I, I make sure I tell him that. I love my coffee in the morning. Always say please and thank you. Compliment others. Talk highly about others. And, or, or talk highly about someone in front of them. That's a really good technique. 
um, make sure you're talking highly about them and not the other direction. I don't think that's appropriate. Um, if you're talking highly about someone kind of bragging about them in front of or to someone else where they can hear, I think that's a neat way to show appreciation too. Uh, another thing you can do is send thank you cards or texts um, to create an attitude of gratitude in your family. So like if there's a birthday party or something and, and your child gets gifts, make them write thank you cards to all their friends. Um, if they have a play date, have them, hey, why don't you send a text to your friend and thank them for coming over today and telling you had a good time. Those little things. And when your child sees you doing them, guess what happens? They're more likely to do it too. All right. We're almost through. We got two more letters here. Okay. Communication. What is healthy communication? Well, from personal relationships to our workplace, communication is a make or break skill. Among many benefits, communicating well help, helps us form close relationships. It brings cohesion to teams and take on leadership roles. Great communicators enjoy more fulfilling relationships. They connect faster with others on many levels. And what good communicators um, do is they actively listen and value each other's opinion. They take turns listening and sharing, are empathetic and understanding. They make decisions together and include others. And they talk through disagreements. They forgive, apologize, and compromise. That's what healthy communication should look and feel like. Um, they don't withhold communication, stonewall, ignore, blame, and hold grudges. That is unhealthy communication. That's gonna shut communication down. So what are some things you can do to teach your kids to foster friendships? right? So communication skills that foster friendships in their life. One of the things that they can do to kind of meet new people and things is to teach them to question, to ask questions. So when they meet someone, have them ask the person a question like, hey, and you can brainstorm these questions. You can think of like, oh, what's your favorite sport? Or what's your, what, you know, do you have a favorite um, movie or show or color or whatever? Um, you can think of different questions to ask people and that makes people feel like someone thinks they're interesting and everyone's favorite topic is themselves, right? So of course that will help people make friends. So that's an easy way to foster that. Another thing to talk about is sharing. So how we share information about ourselves can either attract or repel people. Remind our children that um, to have balanced conversations with sharing and questioning so that they're not always talking about themselves, right? Sometimes we have to teach our kids to um, have balance in a group, right? Maybe they're raising their hand too much or you know, asking too many questions or whatever. So just having a balance. It's not that you, you, you wanna cut them down, but you wanna make sure they're aware of how it's affecting others. So you can brainstorm ways to share information about yourself without sound or like a know-it-all and talk about the tone of voice and the words you use when you're sharing. And then the third thing that they could try is to extend invitations. So every day we have opportunities to extend invitations to other people. For kids, an invite might sound like, um, do you want to play basketball during recess or do you want to hang out this weekend? Something like that. Let your children know that it's okay for people to decline an invitation and vice versa. Role play, making a casual invitation, that sounds friendly, and include how to gracefully respond if someone declines. So if someone doesn't wanna go or do something, doesn't mean that they hate you or they don't like you or any of those things. It just means that maybe they're busy or they don't like that activity. And it's not about, it's, that's totally okay. There's nothing about you. All right, our last letter is T for trust for a perfect relationship. To trust means to rely on another person because you feel safe with them and have confidence that they're, they will not hurt or violate you. Trust is the foundation to relationships because it allows you to be vulnerable, open to people without having to be defensive. It's important, a, a vital component in happy and successful relationships. It allows you to be open and giving and it allows you to navigate conflict. Um, when someone's actions are not aligned with their words, you will begin to learn that they're not trustworthy. 
And if they continue to do that repeatedly, it's going to erode the trust. And that'll create negativity, fear, insecurity, loneliness, depression, anxiety in extreme cases, and can even lead to the inability to concentrate because someone's worried all the time, okay? So how do you rebuild trust if you've lost it? This is a tough one because a lot of times, sometimes the trust might've been lost with you as a parent. If you have a young person who did something, um, you know, and, and you lost trust in them, this might be something to talk to them about how to rebuild it with you. Start with being reliable, consistent, open, honest, and willing to work on the relationship. You got to talk to one another and find ways to connect. You got to listen empathetically, be present, ask questions, all those good things, okay? And you got to also look within yourself. You got to be continually be more aware of your thoughts, your emotions, your needs, right? And you need to show integrity. The more you show integrity, the more that's gonna build the trust in the relationship. So you can acknowledge and take responsibility for any mistakes you made, apologize for any harm you did, and be clear and specific about how things will be approached differently next time or in the future. And be patient. It takes time to build trust once it's broken. Isn't that true? All right, so it's our last slide for info and we're gonna be wrapped up here. So just to go through this one more time, the perfect relationship starts with the relationship with your child. So play, families that play together, stay together. Be silly, create family traditions. Empathy, talk about feelings and help your child identify feelings of others and help them appropriately share their own feelings. Remember the I language? Respect. Talk about setting boundaries and role play friendship troubles with your children. Feedback. Be intentional about using loving feedback. Ask before giving feedback. And use the sandwich when you do. Attention and appreciation. Teach children to hear, right? Be involved. You can do things like do the carpool. Uh, schedule play dates or have the kids at your house, um, attend sports games, et cetera. Th those kinds of things show attention, but it also gives you a little insight into your child's relationship so you can um, help them navigate them more. Also. Create an attitude of gratitude, the family gratitude jar. Communication, talk about your childhood, mistakes and lessons you learned. Share stories, quotes, and catchy sayings to teach character and try to eat at least one meal a day as a family. Families that eat together more often are closer. And that is like a really simple thing you can do to improve your relationship with your own, within your own family, okay? Use teachable moments to bring things up. And when you are communicating with your kids, practice sounding curious versus concerned to keep an open dialogue with your teens. Sometimes if they're sharing stuff with you, you might go, oh my gosh, what do I do? And if you look concerned or worried, they're not gonna share with you anymore. So sound more curious if you can. Oh, tell me more about that. What was, I don't, I don't know what that is. Do you, can you explain that to me? Or what do you know about that? Trust, be reliable, consistent, open, and honest. All right, so next, I guess we'll, we'll chat now. We have the, we can open up the Q&A, Lindsay. Um, if any of you had an aha moment or if there was like a strategy that you, you were reminded of today and you want to share that really quick in the Q&A chat, um, that would be awesome. But we can definitely go ahead and open it up for questions. And I just want to quickly thank um, South Bay Families Connected and let you guys know that um, the website is amazing resource for you. There's tons of wellness videos and resource topics on the website and you guys have your own for your day as well. So please visit that and I'm sure we can probably even get this video recording up on there for you as well. All right, I'll go ahead and stop sharing and Lindsay, if there's any Q&A. Okay, so we don't Hi. actually have any questions in the Q&A. Um, I don't know if there's any participants who would like to um, raise their hand. Um, we got a comment that said, thank you very much. It was terrific. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. This is a big topic. It was hard to know exactly 
lot to talk about. So I know there was a lot of things, um, it was kind of a fire hydrant of info coming at you, but uh, I, heard, I hope that the acronyms help and I hope that a couple of the tips to use with your, your family, with your kids is helpful for everyone. We're getting took lots of feedback. Notes. Yeah, lots of notes, awesome. actions, tips. Um, uh, one of my coworkers just texted me and said, how's the webinar? And I said, it's very practical. It's like very, like can put to use immediately as a parent. So um, we really appreciate that. Oh, that's so good. That's so good. We all need that support sometimes, you know? And I think um, will the slides be available. I can, I think that's the recording will be available, probably not the slides, but you could definitely watch it again. You might need to all because it was a lot of stuff but um you know was there any aha moments what, what was your favorite thing put in the chat what was there a tip or something that just you think you're going to remember or share with your kids is there a certain thing that stuck with you okay maybe not <laughs> that's okay Suge oh, here we go. S suggestions on how to rephrase the typical questions. Aren't those good? Yeah, just the, how was your day today, right? Just different ways to say that and engage our kids to keep them talking to us. I appreciate the acronym. That's a good reminder. Yes, good, good, good. Any specific tips for moms of teen girls to keep a great relationship once they go off to college and later? Ooh, yes, that's a good one. Um, Gosh, I would say just stay in touch in the way that's easiest for them. So I, I would say that probably this generation going to college is going to love to text. So if you can, you know, text or send pictures or um, little emojis or you know the little picture things you can text, right? Just to let them know that you're thinking about them. I think that's helpful, and uh, you know. Buy their plane ticket to come home for the holidays helps too, right? Um, Do you have I can any share. Tips for yeah, yeah, if I Lindsay. share, um, I have actually two folks in my office who just recently had kids go off to college and they, one's a boy and one is a, a young lady. So this works for both, you know, genders. Um, they actually have a set time that they actually talk every week. Um, oh, and what that does good. is it allows the family to kind of, you know, they all get on FaceTime together and they all get to say hi to uh, each other. Um, but that kind of helps the kiddos um, stay connected to what's going on in the family, but also give them kind of a set time. And um, um, I will say one of them actually is a, is a sophomore and they've been doing it for two years. So it's been really, oh, neat. really great. Yeah. And then I also see here, um, a parent says video calls are great when communicating with kids in college. Um, mm -hmm. and also when they call pick up. So I can tell you that, um, you know, we've had some instances where, um, you know, one of the kids will be walking to class and then we'll want to FaceTime mom and, you know, she'll pick up and it's just, you know, something really, a really quick question, but it's nice for them to see each other's face. And then also be able absolutely. to absolutely okay oh patricia said a video family dinner that's great yeah. absolutely yes, and that's exactly what one of um my colleagues is doing is a video family dinner so everybody's and sometimes mm -hmm. grandma grandpa's in there so um yeah. they happen to do theirs on sunday and it just happens to be when they do their family dinner absolutely or happy hour with your friends i mean this when we were on covid that's what we did yeah. right we did the zoom so you can still do those things and i, I know with my um my son, our grandma is in Sacramento and she videos with him all the time. And she feels like she gets to see him growing up, which is really, really nice. So definitely schedule, right? I love that. Lindsay said that. Yeah. said that just got to schedule it. Yeah. And it feels like a priority for everyone, right? It makes it, everyone feel like it's important, which is really nice. Um, it is. We, we do have a question in the uh, Q and A. Can you provide sure. tips on repairing relationships with kids' cousins? Repairing relationships. Okay, so it doesn't have to be a cousin. It could just be a family member, I suppose, right? So when we have trouble within families, you, I mean, really, you got to talk it out. You got to communicate. So I would say maybe you can get the cousins together. I don't know if, what the age difference is like, but if they're pretty close in age, maybe you could have them over and you know, they can kind of work it out and, and talk through things. It's just like siblings too. Siblings fight, cousins fight. Any Anybody who's close to each other can have arguments and fights. And it, sometimes you need to take a break. Sometimes you need to um, 
you know, communicate what you're feeling or tell someone, Hey, I don't like it when you do this, or this hurt, hurt me when you said that, or when that was said, say you, I just did it. <laughs> uh, I felt hurt when you, this happened. So things like that. I, I don't really know specifically without knowing all the details of it, um, how to help you the best with that question. But Lindsay, I don't know. Do you have any tips, tips for that parent there? I mean, I also think um, depending on the age, I mean, I think that's kind of where it's at, right? Sometimes they may need, um, you know, somebody to moderate, but because there's two adults that would be involved, maybe the two adults can kind of work together to determine what would be the best course, um, not knowing the situation and kind of why there was a riff, um, but just kind of working together. Because I think most importantly for family members, the kids are always watching, right? So the adults modeling the behavior that um, we want our kids to see, I think is really, really, really important um, because they're watching when we're not, we don't think they are, um, but we know that kids oftentimes will pick up on things that we don't actually even realize are happening. That is very true, very true. Well, this is good stuff, you guys. I appreciate you all being here and taking the time. I know you guys are busy. I hope something was helpful and yeah, I guess, I don't know, is there anything else? Did we get all the questions? Are there any more last questions? There was one more question. Um, in, in okay. it obviously when trust has been broken, it's hard and takes patience. A lot of patience, especially when dealing with a high school teenager, but any tips on how a parent can continue to remind ourselves that this is a process of learning and growing and mistakes are going to happen. But at what point do we say that's not okay anymore? Oh my goodness. Okay. A lot of patience. Yes. Yeah, especially when dealing with the high school team. Um, you know, can I share a story? <laughs> I lost my parents' trust when I was 13. Um, I took something from the store and I got caught and I was really, really sorry about it. And I remember my mom wouldn't let me carry a purse for like two months. <laughs> I couldn't wear pockets, anything. She was afraid of me stealing. And it was really hard to figure out how to build that trust back with my parents, right? To let them know I learned my lesson. I'm never doing that again. Like that was so embarrassing. I got it. And it just, it took time. And, and when, you, you know, as far as, let me go back to what you, can you go back to, um, let me see what she said. Any tips on how a parent can continue to remind ourselves this is a process of learning growing up. Yes. Um, talk to other parents. That's my best tip. Talk to other parents. Because when you do, you realize they're going through the same exact thing as you. You're not alone. And that gives you a little bit of peace of mind too. And you're going to have to remind yourself that you're doing the best you can. You're exactly the parent your child needs. You, um, you got this, like there, there, there's things, I'm gonna grab it real quick. I have this thing on my fridge because I need to remind myself. Here it is, remind yourself you're doing an awesome job. This is on my fridge right now. So my home is a safe place. I'm exactly who my kid needs. That's a good one. Um, I am my child's rock. My kids trust me and look up to me. I am making happy memories with my child. Everything I do serves a purpose for my family. I'm leaving a legacy of love. And at the, at the end of the day, everyone feels loved and safe. I have done enough. So you just gotta work on your mindset, mom. And uh, just know you're not alone. Teen, teenage years can be rough. And sometimes there's a lot of figuring out who they are and trying on different things and, and they're gonna make mistakes. I don't know how else to help. Lindsay, any tips for, for this mother as well? Sure, so I was a, uh, I was a high school counselor for many years. Um, and so I would hear both sides of this. I would hear the, the teenager side, the, the student side. I, was also, I would also hear the parent side. Um, you know, obviously I think it, it's gonna take time, but I also think um, it's really important for parents to not prosecute their kids forever, right? Because then kids, feel less yes. motivated to try. And so even though as adults, we're very upset, I think it's important to know that kids are gonna make mistakes. And if they continue to do things to erode trust, 
right? I think then at that point, then you start to, you know, make some real clear cut boundaries. So I think to go back to the boundaries piece, right? This is is it. We're not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to pay for your cell phone, whatever that is. But if your Mm -hmm. child really isn't continuing to make you know, additional mistakes, it's really important to work on, even if it's small things to allow them some space to prove to their, to you as parents that they're worthy of your trust again. Um, I think that piece is really important because, um, you know, as parents, we feel like we're not doing a great job and we feel like maybe we failed because our child has made a mistake, but also this is part of the learning and growing process. Um, And I've had parents who are very upset with their kids and they've done, you know, some pretty significant things, but we also have to find space to to also forgive and to have conversation. Um, What I would hear from teens often when I was um, still out of high school was that um, I'm trying, my parents are still really upset with me, it's been four months, I still don't have X, Y, and Z. Um, so really kind of looking at opportunities to kind of, you know, give them small leeway. And then if we need to take that back, we can. Great advice. So you should have done that whole presentation. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Uh, I'm learning stuff to you guys. You guys are all in this together, you know, and we all do the best we can. And you being here says a lot to me already. So I already know that you are rocking this parenting thing. And um, you guys, you guys are going to raise healthy kids. Don't worry. And and these tips are so helpful. This got to revisit them, remind yourself and keep stuff on your fridge like I do if you need. Right. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here, everyone. Thank you to Jennifer. Excellent. Um, I actually got some tips and I was actually, um, you know, I'm going to share some of these practical tips with some friends of mine who, you know, aren't parents in the district. So thank you again. Um, and we will be posting this, um, the recording of the webinar, both on the district website, and I will send that so that it can be posted on the PVP USD um, Families Connected website as well. Awesome. Yay. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful evening. You too. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.